This is day nine of reading Revelation. Then I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud, with a halo around his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet were like pillars of fire. In his hand he held a small scroll that had been opened. He placed his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and then he cried out in a loud voice as a lion roars. When he cried out, the seven thunders raised their voices too. When the seven thunders had spoken, I was about to write it down. But I heard a voice from heaven say, Seal up what the seven thunders have spoken, but do not write it down. Then the angel I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by the one who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them. There shall be no more delay. At the time when you hear the seventh angel blow his trumpet, the mysterious plan of God shall be fulfilled as he promised to his servants, the prophets. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go, take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went up to the angel and told him to give me the small scroll. He said to me, Take and swallow it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will taste as sweet as honey. I took the small scroll from the angel's hand and swallowed it. In my mouth it was like sweet honey, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Then someone said to me, You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, Come and measure the temple of God and of the altar, and count those who are worshipping in it. But exclude the outer court of the temple. Do not measure it, for it has been handed over to the Gentiles, who will trample the holy city for forty-two months. I will commission my two witnesses to prophesy for those twelve hundred and sixty days, wearing sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the, th the Lord in, of the earth. If anyone wants to harm them, fire comes out of their mouths and devours their enemies. In this way, anyone wanting to harm them is sure to be slain. They have the power to close up the sky so that no rain can fall during the time of their prophesying. They also have power to turn water into blood and to afflict the earth with any plague as often as they wish. When they had finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will wage war against them and conquer them and kill them. Their corpses will lie in the main street of the great city, which has a symbolic name Sodom and Egypt, where indeed their Lord was crucified. Those from every people, tribe, tongue, and nation will gaze on their corpses for three and a half days, and they will not allow their corpses to be buried. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and be glad and exchange gifts because these two prophets tormented the inhabitants of the earth. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them. When they stood on their feet, great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven say to them, Come up here. So they went up to heaven in a cloud as their enemies looked on. At that moment there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell in ruins. Seven thousand people were killed during the earthquake. The rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe had passed, but the third is coming soon. With the blowing of the seventh trumpet, once again we have the image of completion or fullness. Something has been brought to its conclusion. Everything is as God would intend it to be. And with the seventh trumpet, something new and bigger is going to happen in the, 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 the history of, of salvation, God's salvation history, and in the history of, of humankind. This image of the eating the scroll is an interesting echo back to the prophets. There are similar images in Ezekiel and in Jeremiah where they are told to eat scrolls and describe them as tasting sweet. The sweet taste is probably the beautiful rhetoric, uh, the, the way that the preacher can be completely carried away with the message when the spirit is truly in it and truly in the speaker and the words are in some way not even his or her own entirely. 
but that doesn't change the fact that the message is still pretty hard. That's the, the sour stomach. When we hear the words, we might think, gee, that sounds pretty good. But once we stop and think about what they mean, they're speaking about us and our sinfulness, our distance from the image of Christ. And so we don't want to hear them. In any event, there seems to be a commissioning toward prophecy, which is understood here as, as different from apocalyptic. You recall I talked at the beginning about how apocalyptic is talking about future events, but in some respects, Revelation is also a prophetic book. It's also speaking about the present time, both the present time when the writer wrote it and also by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it's speaking prophetically about our own time what we see around us. I'll come back to that in a minute. First, it's important to see here, I think, that the prophets are humble. They're described as wearing sackcloth, but their words have power. How often is that the case in the way that we live our lives and the way we choose whose message we're going to listen to? More often than not, we want to listen to the message that comes from the person who stepped out of the Rolls Royce rather than the person who stepped off the Greyhound bus. And then that comes to the point of why it is that we respond to prophecy in the way that we do. The people are described here as exchanging gifts when the prophets are killed because they have been so annoying to them. I wonder why it is that we rejoice to see prophets silenced. This is often the case uh, when someone has been a thorn in the side of society on one issue or another and is somehow brought down either by a scandal or by malevolent action, by prosecution, by exile, by any other of the many means that human power has to silence those it doesn't want to hear. Why is it that we seem to rejoice at that? Why it is that we are relieved when we no longer have to listen to this person who was telling us things we didn't want to hear? That image of bodies lying in the street is an oddly modern one. It, when I read it, it made me think of, of Mogadishu and Baghdad and other places where modern warfare has been brought into our living rooms and everywhere else on our, our mobile devices, everywhere we can think of. I think in the CNN age, the apocalypse would be televised. And if it were, it would be interesting to think for a minute about what we would make of it. If we saw something like this, <clears throat> something as strange and foreign as what is described here happening somewhere in the world, would we think of it as fake news? Would we think it must surely be the error of the reporter? Would we think it's the bias of the liberal media? They're always reporting the worst of everything when in reality things are calm everywhere else. We think of it as just ratings fodder, whether it's on the right wing media or the left wing. They're just doing it because they know it'll it'll get clicks, it'll get people to look at their website and to patronize their advertisers. I think for as much as these stories seem to be about despicable people in a very abstract sort of way, we can't get off the hook entirely before we look at ourselves and ask how we deal with these situations, even now, even today, in our own society, how we deal with news we don't want to hear, and how we're able to minimize and marginalize it, and go back to whatever it was that was entertaining us, how much of our time is spent being anesthetized by that which we find pleasing, rather than that which is challenging, but nonetheless is true. Fais-le, fais